In this malicious compliance story, I had fresh stitches under my hat, and my teacher has a no hats in class policy. Sure thing, teacher. The car accident was of the side impact variety, and it was brutal. This was in the days before airbags and seatbelt laws. One second, I'm driving, and the next, I'm halfway out the passenger window watching blood run off my head to pull in the glass of a previously closed window. Another second ticks, and I'm in the ER receiving receiving 13 crude stitches for 11 inches of wide open scalp. I lost more than two pints of blood and a large patch of hair. I also lost my favorite white fishnet t-shirt, but that is a separate tragedy. That Friday of Labor Day weekend was how my name shows up in the newspaper list of Labor Day weekend accidents. Tuesday comes and I go to class at the local college. Being a teenager gave me the gift of immortality. There I was, fully ambulatory, just four days after a serious car accident. For the sake of propriety, I'm wearing a hat to cover the fresh injury. It was a white Panama hat with a bright 80s style hat band. This was in 1983. Everything was 80s style, but that's a separate tragedy. Hobbling along, I made it to sociology just as class was beginning. I take a seat at the back of class and settle in. The conversation went something like this. Excuse me, could you remove your hat please? The teacher had her own sense of propriety. My hat didn't fit with proper classroom attire. I was in a car accident, I replied. Did she hear my words or was one of her rude students muttering another in a career long list of excuses? Likely the latter was the case. Take off the hat now. You cannot wear that in my class. She indicated that she was not happy at all with my hat. Not at all. Well, okay then. Off comes my hat. Roughly a third of my hair had been shaved off. The wound was pink and puckered. The seam had a line of dried blood in it. The wound began an inch beyond my missing hairline and continued back, branching into a Y shape. The surgeon's instructions were to keep the wound clean, dry, and unbandaged. Lucky for all in attendance, my mother had washed my scalp the previous day. She used the word gore at some point to describe what she was washing off. Imagine now you're one of my classmates. Whatever you would say at that point would be something I heard from my classmates and friends. Ah, you can put your hat back on, said the teacher. Not before a little malicious compliance, I won't. But what I said was, but I can't wear hats in class, I replied. I mean, I can do it, but not if I'm breaking the rules. Please put your hat back on. Okay, if you insist. And the hat went back on my head. My advice is not to engage in malicious compliance on the first day of class, not in a course where the teacher gives essay questions. That was the only C I received that semester, but that's a separate tragedy. I'm guessing the teacher in this case didn't understand what the OP meant when they said that they were in a car accident. If the OP just straight up said, hey, I have gigantic wet open wounds on my head that I'm not allowed to put bandages on, that's what's under my hat, then the teacher maybe would have been a little bit more receptive to the car accident reason. But that's a separate tragedy. Let me know what you would do if you're in the situation down below. My professor fails me because my group went ghost during our group project. So I was in a speech class. It was my last semester, completely online due to COVID. Our professor assigned us to a group speech that we were to record and send it to him by the due date. I thought it would be easy enough as he gave us two weeks to work on it and group speeches weren't anything new to me. He even made separate discussion boards for our groups that we could use to communicate. This project was worth 30% of our grade, so failing this project meant that you would pretty much fail the course. I wanted to get it done early so we wouldn't have to worry about it, so I immediately posted a message to everyone in the group asking when they were free to do a Zoom meeting to discuss a project. No reply for a few days by any of them. I then post again, this time a little more stern as it didn't seem any of them cared enough to even reply at all. I waited a few more days, and at this point we only had a week left before it was due, so I just divided up the work and posted what everyone would need to write for their portion of the speech and gave them a day and time that I would be holding a Zoom meeting for the final recording to send to the professor. Still, no reply. It was now the day before the speech was to be recorded and two days before the speech was due, and my group members had not made an attempt to make contact in any form at all. So I did the only thing I could think of and emailed my professor explaining the situation, but I assumed he would not reply because throughout the entire semester, it took him over a week to reply to any email 
emails I had sent him. I then did the entire group project on my own, which took me the whole night with no sleep. After I finished writing everyone's speech, it was around the time I had scheduled the Zoom meeting to record. I joined it out of amusement knowing nobody in my group would be there. Sure enough, it was empty, so I did the entire speech myself, but the rubric really put an emphasis on transitioning to our other group members, including saying their name. So between every section where it would cut to a different member, I would say something like, and now me, my name, will explain the importance of blah, 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 then mute my screen briefly as if to add a cut, put on a different hat and continue the speech. I did this for all six portions of the speech. I turned in the speech story shortly after and filled out the group member role sheet that was due as well. I just put my name in every box that was supposed to be a different member. A week passes and I see he graded the project, still not replying to my previous email about the situation, by the way, and he gave me a zero, stating it was supposed to be a group project and me doing it solo meant I did not follow instructions. I was actually infuriated by this and knew that emailing him about the grade was as good as useless, so I went straight above him to the board of the college and explained to them what happened. They apologized and said the situation wouldn't be resolved within a few hours of me talking to the board. He had replied to my email three times stating he was sorry for the miscommunication about the project and that my grade would be corrected. He scolded me for going above him saying, I should have just emailed him if I couldn't get in contact with my classmates and putting the blame on me for not trying harder to reach out to them. The next semester, I saw that he was no longer with the school. My guess is that it was a habit of his not to reply to emails and got fired for it. And this corrected grade was a 70. But I was so mentally exhausted from the situation at this point that I didn't care to fight it anymore. So am I the jerk? If the professor was fired because of this type of situation, it couldn't have only happened with the OP. This must have been happening all across the board. Like not only was he not answering people's emails, he must also be trying to give people zeros for a totally completed project when they also had things outside of their control. In this case, I mean, he has the proof that he wrote these emails to all of his classmates, his group members multiple times, and the proof that he wrote the email to him, the professor himself, which is why it's so strange that he would say if the OP couldn't contact the group members to not reach out to him instead of going above him because the OP did and he didn't respond after what seems like quite a long period of time. Maybe what he meant was going in person to his office hours or something, but that's not what he said here on the post. So let me know what you would do in a situation like this down below. My mortgage was sold to a company that wants to charge me $14.95 to pay my bill online. So I sent them a check every week for one one fourth that amount instead. Last year, for like the sixth time since we bought our house, our mortgage was sold to yet another company. I've never been late paying it, have occasionally made extra payments, but I've never had any issues. But this new company wants to charge me $14.95 for a convenience fee to take a payment online. This is absolutely stupid. I can make the payment over the phone and pay another fee, or I can mail a check slash money order for no fee. Also, I can set up auto pay, give them access to my bank account, but that's a hard no from me. So I went online and my bank has a neat bill pay service where you can set it to repeat monthly, weekly, etc. I took the monthly payment, rounded it up a bit, and then set my bank to cut them a check every week for a bit over a fourth of the amount. Doesn't cost me a dime. I don't even pay postage. I'm sure the money comes out of the account a little earlier than the mortgage company actually gets it, losing me a tiny bit of interest or something. But man, it makes me feel better than trying to charge me 15 dollars for what is essentially an automated process for them. They now get to process four to five checks a month. And I'm sure they have the whole process down to an art for minimal human interaction, but it's not zero. I really want to press my luck and send one thirtieth of the payment every day, but I figured my bank might cut me off at that point, which would be one check for every single day of the month. This one is actually pretty awesome. A fine showing in the art of malicious compliance. At first, I didn't completely understand why it was one fourth of the amount. I thought it was because he was calculating for not paying the fee, but he's just saying in order to send them as many checks as possible so that it's annoying for them to have to go and cash these checks every single month as a way to get back at them for charging this absurd $15 a month online convenience fee. I've seen some of these online convenience fees that are absolutely ridiculous. One of the ones that I saw not too long ago was $60 for every time you wanted to pay, which is totally absurd. If his bank actually allowed him to do 1 30th of the payment so he could send out a check every day, that would be pretty hilarious. And I think 
think the company would get the message a lot quicker than four checks a month in this case. If you guys have ever had any experiences with these ridiculous convenience fees, let me know down below. In this malicious compliance story, the OP blows a major aerospace company's mind with a foreign graduate degree. I work for a big American technology and defense firm with tens of thousands of employees. A senior executive who had worked there successfully for years was caught with a falsification on his resume. He was immediately fired and a new policy was instituted requiring all employees to sign a form giving the company permission to query the college or university with their highest claimed degree for verification. I have a doctorate from an old prestigious European university, an institution that I was quite sure would have no interest in such a query. But whatever. I signed the permission form and attached a note warning the company that the university would probably ignore the request, which it did. After a month or two with no response, HR called me in and said that the university had not responded as I warned, but that corporate would accept a photocopy of my degree. Fine. I'm good with that. Remember the old prestigious European university part? My degree is a piece of actual parchment about the size of a throw rug with a wax seal about a centimeter thick and written entirely in Latin. So I bring it into the office and photocopy it a bit at a time by sliding it around on the photocopier window. It takes like 12 pages to get it all. I staple them into a pile and give it to HR who reluctantly pass it on to corporate. Another month passes and HR calls me again. Corporate is complaining that your degree is written in a foreign language. Yep, I say. It's in Latin. Tell them to find a priest to translate it. And I walked out. I never heard them bring it up again. A few other points of clarification that he added was that this took place well over 20 years ago when stuff like this did not happen on the web. Snail mail and paper mail were the standard. And he also mentions that his work is in the civilian sector, which does not require a clearance. Being an American with a foreign PhD did not cause any hassles. What happens in the case where you lose the copy of your degree? I mean, if you can't call up your university to get you a new one, what options do you really have? You just have to have people take you on your word that you actually did go there or carry around this photocopied version of this giant scroll. I've actually never heard of an old university doing this where they just give you a massive scroll and as he describes it like a throw rug instead of just a normal degree but maybe that's just tradition wherever this university is at over in Europe. I would love to know if this corporation actually ended up getting a priest to translate the degree after all. Let me know down below if you've ever heard of anything like this before. Am I the jerk for not snow blowing the new neighbor's driveway. Our old neighbor, Mr. B, passed away last year. He was a very sweet old man, kind of like the neighborhood grandpa. He was a widower in the last couple of years, started having mobility issues. When it snowed, we would go over with a snowblower and clear his driveway and salt the walk. In the summer, if I was out mowing, I would do his lawn too. When his health went downhill, we got his groceries and would bring him meals. When he passed away, we continued to mow the lawn and take care of the outside of the house when it was vacant. His children were very appreciative and thanked us for taking care of Mr. B when they could not be there. They eventually sold the house and the new neighbors moved into the house in the fall. We introduced ourselves and did the standard neighbor greeting. We noticed they didn't have any lawnmowers or snowblowers, so we told them that they should get those things sooner rather than later since we typically start getting snow in November. A few times when I was out mowing, the neighbor asked me to mow their lawn and I obliged, but I told him that they should really consider getting their own yard tools or calling a service. We just had a huge snowfall and are expected to get more this weekend. The neighbor came to my house early on Sunday morning and banged on my door asking when I was going to be out snow blowing as they needed to get to work. I told the neighbors that I was not going to shovel slash snow blow anytime soon so they may want to dig their cars out so they could get to work. He told me that they didn't have any shovels and explained that they were relying on me to come over and take care of it. I told him that I was not planning on doing that. I told him that he he could borrow a shovel if he would like, but I was going back to bed. When I did go out to shovel and snow blow several hours later, I did not do their driveway. The neighbors are now angry at me and he confronted me outside saying that it's my fault they had to call out of work. My wife thinks that I should have sucked it up and went over, but I told her that I'm not a landscaping service and that I should not have to wake up early and shovel their driveway. Am I the jerk for not snow blowing for the neighbors? The level of entitlement here is a unbelievably high. It makes me wonder if they knew that the OP was doing the shoveling and snow blowing for Mr. B and thought that was a perk of the house or something. I mean, the OP clearly keeps warning them that they got to get their own tools and start doing it, but yet they did none of that. 
And I can't believe that he obliged to mow their lawn when he was mowing his lawn. That just seems so weird. Maybe it was that exact moment that it enabled this entire situation. But let me know what you would do if your neighbors did this to you and got mad at you and confronted you for not snow blowing and mowing their lawn. Jerk or not a jerk and why? Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel with notifications turned on. Follow on Instagram to see more videos and check out the podcast all linked down below. Thanks a lot for watching guys and we'll see you next time.